introduced you to everyone as Ernest, you answer to the name of Ernest. You look as if... It's about two men who uh, have fallen in love with two women. But both this, these women insist that they can only fall in love with a man if his name is Ernest. But these men, are, uh, these men's names are not Ernest. One is Jack and one is Algernon. Well, my own dear, sweet, loving little darling, I really can't see why you should object to the name of Algernon. So they both lie and pretend to be Ernest. It's a very strange, uh, uh, insane uh, tale. Gerald Barry has a profound instinct that uh, Oscar Wilde expressed something very important about human beings. And Gerald has cut the uh, play enormously. And it shows you, when I had one third left, how strong the structure of the original play is. The bones of it are very strong. You're left, in my version, with an X-ray, a metallic uh, skeleton. Who is Cecil B? Cecil is Mr. Thomas Cardew's granddaughter. I am the guardian. She lives at my place in the country under the charge of her admin. Rebel Gardeners, Miss Prism. We haven't got any of the sort of uh, Victorian costumes. There's, no, there's none of the doors and walls and anti macassars and all the rest of it but they're recognisably the same characters in the same situations. Well, one of the most famous characters is Lady Bracknell, who is this um, 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 uh, monstrous figure, who in my version is played by uh, a big mm. heavyweight man. In the play, in the second act, Gwendolyn is in the garden and it says that she's tending to her flowers. And one of the central things for Oscar Wilde is that he was always talking about artificiality and reality. And he always said that what's artificial trumps what is real. What's real is rather banal, it's dull, it's everyday, we have it all the time. What's artificial is gorgeous. He spent a lot of time, actually Oscar Wilde, his symbol was a green carnation. And green carnations actually don't exist in reality. And they, you have to put green dye underneath and they go up and then they become green. Through fakeness, you can sort of get to something that's real. And it's very strange how suddenly you go, oh my God, that feels real, even though everything is patently rubbish. There's a big scene where about 40 or 45 plates are smashed in the second act. It's an expression of anger. It's a duel between these two women, Gwendolyn and Cecily. And Gwendolyn is incredibly angry with Cecily because she suspects that Cecily is trying to steal her man. And uh, there is a very formal then breaking of uh, plates to express her uh, unimaginable anger. And there's been a lot of discussion actually with Gerald about what sound it would make and should it be done in a barrel and there's been health and safety things about blah, 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 as you can imagine. But I think we've come to a solution where actually we can smash them on stage. And it's very interesting because when you see something, I think you hear it differently. Gerald's music is really very vigorous and vibrant and colourful and loud and ear-grabbing. It's amazing to hear it against that text. And so I thought that by putting the text there, and making it, again, part of the production, rather than somewhere apologetically outside the thing, we would give an audience a real chance to um, appreciate the play and then to hear much more clearly what Gerald has done. People would say, well, what could I add to Wilde because of his cut glass text? But in fact, it has worked out as uh, people have found really well. As I cycle here every day, I do think to myself, I wish that Oscar could see this and that he would, he would find his play here living and breathing, you know, just more than 100 years after it was written.